Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to the Sule Institute. If, um, if anyone here is new and joining us for the first time, either on live stream or here, um, I'm Grace Song, and I'm the executive director of the Asuli Institute, and we're so happy to welcome you for this very exciting talk um, as part of the Asuli Institute conversation series. Um, if you're new to the Usuli Institute, we're a nonprofit education institute and we're focused on elevating knowledge and critical thinking in the Islamic tradition. And the main things that we focus on right now, we have weekly virtual khutbahs that Dr. Khalid um, gives, as well as monthly halakhas. So we've been um, going through um, tafsir or detailed um, Quranic commentaries. So we understand you know, the beauty of and the depth of meaning in, in the Quran. Um, and then also we do these conversation series from time to time with various people on issues that are important. And so um, you can find all of that material at our website on usuli.org. And um, we're so happy and honored to have um, Professor Abdullah al, al um today with us. Um, he and his uh, lovely wife, Tagreed, um, flew all the way here to be with us um, from the East Coast. And um, Professor Al Auda is actually a senior research fellow at the Center for Muslim and Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. Um, and so we're, we're just delighted to have this conversation here about some very important issues happening that obviously uh, Professor Bofuddle has been talking about in his khutbahs recently and um, you know that we're feeling very strongly about. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanted to so highlight, um, I don't know if people have had an opportunity to see the very powerful khutbah yesterday. I just, if you haven't seen it yet, I wanted to encourage you to do that. Um, Dr. Abel Fuddle here gave a very fiery and impassioned khutbah um, as a response to being banned from giving his khutbah at the Islamic Center of Southern California um, because he wanted to, he originally asked to do Janazah prayer on um, President Mohammed Morsi. And this is kind of the fallout that happened from that request. Um, and you know more than just an you know indictment of how that decision was made, it's actually a very impassioned plea um, and wake up call, I believe, for Muslims at large in terms of like where you stand in terms of justice. And so I really encourage people to watch it and share it, and think about it. It's a really important message for our time. Um, and again, that that's available on YouTube and it on, will be also on our on our website. And I want to say just, you know, um, the response has been incredible. We've, you know, heard from people around the world um, because, you know, it was, it was amazing. And I want to thank people because, you know, a lot of times this path of scholarship and speaking out and truth to power is a very lonely road. And oftentimes those messages that you send make all the difference. It just it makes you feel like you're, you know, you're making a difference, that you're not alone and that, you know, people are with you. So um, thank you. And, you know, please feel free to write in and, and tell us you know how how what's going on you know how you're reacting we appreciate that so with that I'd like to turn it over to Professor Bofuddle and um, what we'll do today is we'll probably do conversation um, for about an hour to an hour and a half and then we'll do a Q&A for about half an hour so we'll try to finish no later than seven so um, it, is, uh, it is really a treat to, to have Abdullah uh, with us today. There, there will be two parts, although not uh, community divided. There is, an, there is an issue of, Greece mentioned the path of scholarship. And the path of scholarship uh, is not just lonely, but often tortuous. Um, there are scholars that reconcile themselves, make peace with those in power, uh, regardless of what those in power do, or regardless of what the decisions are. And um, these scholars have an easy path in life. Uh, scholar, a, a scholar is a valuable asset to anyone in power because they provide a necessary apologetic uh, legitimating role. Uh, and that role could be and often is 
not just destructive for the institutions of society, but has a very long-term, um, detrimental long-term effect uh, in that it, the betrayal of a scholar makes people lose faith in the word and lose faith in ideas. And when people lose faith in ideas, what follows is inevitably an identity crisis. On the other hand, there are scholars that understand that the, the, uh, carrying the responsibility of a word is a very grave burden. And, um, and so they don't make peace with those in power, and the past then is not just lonely, but the, it entails a great deal of suffering, an enormous amount of suffering. And I think it, it's, uh, it, this applies very much to some man in order, um, who is a very famous figure, but is currently in prison in Saudi Arabia. And so th there is a part which we will talk about those who are detained in Saudi Arabia and try to understand the Saudi Arabia is, is often puzzling and confusing for outsiders. Uh, we'll try to understand why and what will become of them. And, um, and then there is a, another component that I really want to find is that Abdullah is in his, his own right a, a rising scholar. Um, uh, he did his doctorate at, at Pittsburgh. Uh, like, my, uh, like myself, he's in law. Uh, his doctorate is uh, an SJD, is uh, a doctorate in law. And there are a lot of very interesting intellectual questions that I want to pick his brain on for the benefit <coughs> of everyone. So let's start with Sheikh Salman al I mean, for those who might not know, Salman al is probably one of the most prominent uh, scholarly figures in Islam today. Uh, on, um, I think he, on, on, um, he had 14 or 15 million followers. Um, I been reading Salman's all those writings and watching his lectures for for a long time. Uh, I have to say that I have been I, I watched a, a series of lessons that he gave from Turkey, and the the what's quite remarkable about him is how willing he is to reinvestigate and rethink issues. He's um, uh, he's constantly revisiting his ideas and evolving his ideas. And quite frankly, I, I thought that considering that we don't have many individuals like San Man in the world today, we don't, we don't have religious figures that are recognized as authorities within Islamic theology and law not just in Saudi, but around the Muslim world. Whether you're an Arabic speaker or not, you, you, you consider Salman and all that authority. And I have to be honest, I was really puzzled by <clears throat> the, the process of, the, the, you know, any, any decision made politically you think involves a balancing of pros and cons, you know, the benefit versus the, the, the cost of the decision. What, what does Saudi gain from arresting someone like Saman al Oda, bringing charges against them that amount to khabur, spying and treason, and calling for his execution? What is what is the thought process? Why? Well, uh, first of all, I'm so honored to, uh, to be invited by uh, the great scholar, of, uh, Dr. Khaled Fahmal. I've been a uh, very long time admirer of his works, and uh, uh, even myself talked with uh, 
with my father a lot about him and we discussed some of his ideas and my father liked him and uh, followed uh, uh, some of his works and uh, I've, I've myself <coughs> translated some of the works of Dr. Khan Fadl to my father so he can, uh, he can uh, read some of the literatures that were not translated into Arabic. Uh, to, to summarize uh, my father, as, as doctor said, uh, my father once said, if, uh, if I say in my uh, 60s what I, have been, what I had been saying in my 40s, that means uh, I wasted 20 years of my life without uh, learning new things, without uh, uh, you know, accumulating uh, more knowledge. Because you have to change, and that's why the series you mentioned, the first, uh, the first episode of that series was Naam uh, Yes, I yeah. change. Because he wanted to send the message that it's changing is not just something that happens to you, but something that you have to, uh, to work for as well. You have to adopt and you have to instrumentalize in, you, in, in order uh, for you to uh, understand uh, Islamic law and to understand the world because Isla because Islam is uh, 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 two elements what they call what what Ibn al-Qayyim once called the understanding the text and understanding the the uh, the world fiqh al and fiqh al nas and for you to produce uh, real knowledge, you have to combine both elements. And understanding the world means uh, uh, understanding the world changes. Understanding that the world uh, always uh, uh, produces uh, new knowledge, produces new things. And that's why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just say, we showed evidence, we showed signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Sanurihim uh, ayat we will show them the signs of the of the uh, of the world and the signs of uh, of of the human beings. So that that was the summary of uh, my father's journey. He was born in uh, a small town called Al Busar in Boraida, and uh, uh, he, uh, you know, studied. Uh, on, on great scholars of the Najid area, but he was different. He was different in a way that he always, with the idea that uh, we have to, he was one of the few uh, scholars, and he was, by the way, he was criticized at, at, at his, uh, you know, uh, very young age when he uh, used to go to a small library that was, uh, uh, that was organized by the, uh, what what Boraida called at the time the socialist library, it was uh, managed by some socialist and some uh, Arabist and some uh, you know uh, people were not really uh, close to what the circles of my father was. Yeah, the religious establishment. Yeah, they were not religious establishment. They were not even religious in any uh, definition, probably. So that so he he he. He always thought that uh, reading new knowledge, reading knowledge is always good for your own religion, for the health of your own knowledge, of the religious knowledge itself. Uh, so he was different in that way. And then uh, uh, after the, you know, he was uh, uh, arrested in 1994. Uh, for five years he was in prison. Right. Yeah. For five years he was uh, put in jail, uh, no legal process in whatsoever existed at that time. He was not uh, transferred into trial at all. Uh, there was no lawyer. Uh, he was held in incommunicado for two years. I remember when he was a little kid, the first time that my father called uh, in 1996, like two years after his, uh, that was the first call. Uh, so he was held in incommunicado for two years. Uh, the total uh, uh, imprisonment was uh, five years. Uh, when he, and the, the arrest, was because he was part of a movement at that time was called the uh, the Islamic Awakening movement. He he criticized that movement later. Also liked uh, some of its elements, but also criticized a lot of it. And he developed his own method and ideas and became uh, his own uh, you know uh, independent uh, 
thinking scholar, candid scholar. Uh, but he was arrested because also, not just because he was a scholar, an Islamic scholar, but, but because also he added to that uh, Islamic scholarly that he has, that he has the, the uh, political side, which is to criticize the government. He was w one of the main uh, concepts that he criticized about the Salafism and, and the, uh, the, the Wahhabi establishment in Arabia uh, were, were, were two doctrines. That's called two doctrines were the two main uh, you know issues that my father criticized uh, before even the, uh, before his first arrest. The, the, uh, the one, uh, one of them is uh, the, the uh, obedience to the ruler, Ta'atul al Amr. The other was the secret advice. And they and and these okay. two concepts. Well, you, well, you, the only way you can, you're only allowed to to give advice to the ruler in confidence, right? In private, but never say anything critical in public, which is very medieval, right? Yeah. And they also try to say that uh, criticizing the ruler in public means uh, disobeying the ruler, and therefore uh, uh, committing. Uh, a sin of rebellion, al khuruj it becomes part of uh, a rebellious uh, movement against the ruler, and therefore uh, could justify even the ruler's crackdown on you and your uh, people because of your criticism. Because, you know, if you, if you listen once to Salih Hafuzan, Salih Hafuzan, for example, once said, uh, uh, the khuruj rebellion, can be intellectual, can be... Uh, uh, factual and can be physical and and by intellectual he means criticizing the ruler per se uh, is uh, a rebellious act is an act of khuruj. yeah is an act of khuruj, is an act of uh, rebellion against the ruler that just that could justify the the uh, the, the violent uh, force against you by the the ruler so that was the the, the, the concept it was very problematic uh, it was not supported by uh, the, even the mainstream, if I may say, in Islamic history. It was uh, probably produced to serve the, the uh, status quo in Saudi Arabia. So my father criticized that. And the other, the secret advice. So my father said, well, if, if uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, uh, you have to... Uh, present advice and nasiha li wulat al to present advice to the ruler what is the what is the point of of, of that advice if that becomes secret one of the main objective of uh, of uh, paying advice to the ruler is is to uh, to uh, to make the public aware of that uh, problem or that issue and if you just do it in secret that means you just uh, Ignoring the public, and you just trying to uh, uh, to make a point with the with the with the ruler or with the the, the public itself then is not elevated and it doesn't become a part of the discourse. Exactly. <coughs> so uh, there were there were the two main concepts that he criticized, and that's why he presented along with some of his colleagues that were not uh, uh, that did not get get, uh, get along with the religious establishment at that time uh, a, a, a petition that was called uh, memorandum of advice. Right. And it was symbolic because of its advice. Again, they they, they, they try to revisit the secret advice concept, and they and, and in that in that petition. And Malawi Rashid, a lot of uh, historians who studied Saudi Arabia uh, 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 thought that was a turning point in the in the religious circles in Saudi Arabia. It divided the, like the 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 religious circles into two: the religious establishment, the regular traditional Wahhabi. And those who combined uh, more uh, more dynamic element, uh, elements uh, into the discourse. So, the member in, in the memorandum of advice, they asked uh, King Fahd at that time to uh, introduce the consultative council. It was, uh, you know, unheard of, uh, the, the, uh, and they asked for uh, what they called an Islamic constitution because there was no constitution whatsoever in Saudi Arabia. So sort of a, a movement towards a, con a constitutional mo monarchy. Right. With, 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 you have a monarch, but you also have 
limits on government and a prime minister. Right. And, a, you know. and accountability, mm -hmm. uh, where you have like a consultative council that can check the executive and can, uh, uh, you know, have uh, some sort of uh, checks and balances. Uh, so there was, uh, I mean, King Fahad was really angry. He did not like the movement. Uh, he banned uh, 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 the, the, the committee at that time that was established in, in 1993. It was called the Committee for the Legitimate Rights, uh, Legitimate Defa al the the, uh, the Committee to Defend the Legitimate Rights in Saudi Arabia. It was banned, and uh, one uh, scholar who was part of the senior scholars was also fired from, was removed from the council because of his engagement in that movement because they did not want to see uh, some people who were, tra who, who were trained uh, as religious scholars join in uh, that popular movement. Uh, I don't know if I deviated from no, the no, question. It's, it's, it's a very important background. Okay. Though, so, go, go on. so yeah, and then, uh, uh, so, like one year after that, uh, after banning the movement, uh, my father uh, got arrested uh, in 1994, and he spent uh, five years because of uh, they demanded uh, reforms. After the 2000, he was uh, so he was released in 1999. Uh, after he was released, uh, he developed uh, uh, some of his own ideas, and he became even more. Uh, if I may say, uh, he, he became closer to what we know as an Islamic Islam, Muhammad Abdul and Afghani, the, 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 the Islamic Enlightenment. The, yeah, the Enlightenment movement uh, centered in Egypt in the early, um, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, late 18th century, early 19th century, well, actually, up to the early 20th century, it still yeah. was going strong. She so, really, uh, yeah, Rashid Rana and so on, yeah. So, uh, so he, he and also he so he developed uh, his discourse uh, specifically into uh, issues in regard to the other uh, sects of Islam and to the uh, to the other and he, and and uh, jurisprudentially uh, in regard to the uh, fiqh of uh, ease, the uh, the the jur uh, jurisprudence of ease, the fiqh taysir. Uh, closer to mo more or less of uh, Qardawi kind of fiqh, and, and, and during, uh, I think in 2005 or six he uh, authored the book If uh, Wala uh, Haraj, in Hajj, which is to, uh, to allow a wide range of practices within Hajj uh, and make it uh, religiously acceptable to make the Hajj easier for people to practice and exercise. Uh, and, and, and and that book was was refuted by uh, one or two of the senior scholars at that time because they thought it's it's uh, too liberal, too liberal, and yeah. way beyond the the uh, the, uh, the traditional uh, jurisprudence that uh, usually uh, they usually adopt. Uh, and the so the, and the first issue was uh, his relationship to the other uh, sects. Uh, so he uh, adopted uh, a greater relationship to the Sufis, and he uh, built bridges with the with the Shias in Saudi Arabia. He met with uh, uh, you know uh, senior influential Shia figures in Saudi Arabia, and it, it was it was really uh, picked up in the news in 2004, I think, when he met with Hassan al Safa, one of the, of the leading uh, Shia scholars in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so that was that was his uh, just the, the summary of uh, his. Just so, you know, in, in Egypt, um, there are, there are people um, from the Salafi movement who considered Salman al Oda a kafir, and every time I would have that conversation with them, it would always be the same things. Um, Salman al Oda is a kafir because he embraced and showed tolerance towards Shia. Uh, he did not, he, he dropped the hostility towards Sufi, uh, various Sufi tariqahs in Egypt. He 
uh, who is willing to appear on television programs where there were women. And in fact, before MBS allowed women to drive, I remember that Salman Oda um, said, why is there a problem with women driving cars? And what, what's fascinating is that the, the well, what we'll call them for, for, for now, it's just the Salafi movement, uh, considered Salman Oda a, a sellout to liberals uh, because he was a student of Ben Baz. Uh, he <clears throat> was trained in, in the Wahhabi school. He, he expressed a great deal of respect for Ben Baz until the last, very last time I, I heard him. But, uh, but yet, he, he evolved a lot of his thinking. One of the, the, the big things there was uh, Abu Shokka wrote uh, a, 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 the, the Liberation of Women at the Time of the Prophet. It's a three volume book. And Salman and Oda praised that book. Right. And it's actually quite a, it, it's a, the book is, is fascinating because all the book does is that he collects hadiths, you know, various narratives from various books and says, oh, look here, you know. How the prophet interacted. Yeah, with just women. read it for yourself. Yeah. And yet, he his, rarely commented. He, he doesn't, Abu Shokka doesn't actually intervene into yeah. the text that much. He just says, here's, here's what the original sources said. Uh, and Salman Oda got slammed for endorsing and recommending this book as a, as a good effort. So, I mean, in terms of, it, it, it was hard for, for critics of, of Wahhabiyya like myself, it, it was, you could no longer point dogmatically to all people who emerged from the Wahhabi school as reflecting certain set doctrines because Salman is an old, that was a very good example of someone who came out of being trained by someone, a, a, a clear classic cut Wahhabi like the best, but yet evolved his ideas into, into a very tolerant, uh, embracing, uh, inclusive Islam that rejected the idea that Islamic doctrine can be espoused without it being carried to real life in a practical and pragmatic fashion. If it didn't work in, in, in practical life, if it clashed with the demands of practical affairs of life, then, then it doesn't work. But I want to go back to this understanding the arrest because you know if if you have a liberal program, yeah. well, he is a very powerful man with so many followers yeah. that, despite all of the the attacks on him, despite all of the, I don't know too many Muslim scholars who have forty million or fifteen million followers. I, I don't I don't know that many Muslim scholars that. Um, cannot be accused of uh, being ignorant of the Quran, cannot be accused of being ignorant of the Hadith, cannot be accused of uh, being ignorant of the Sunnah, but yet it manages to negotiate the Islamic tradition in a way that adapts to what, what are the demands of modernity in, in, in its various forms. So, uh, so why? Well, that's an interesting, very interesting question, and I think these very characteristics of my uh, father, that led to his arrest. And why? Because just put in mind, I mean, I'll, I'll put you in, into the context uh, leading to, to his arrest. Uh, so MBS, uh, I don't know if you're following the, the Saudi politics, but MBS came to power uh, in 2015 uh, as a deputy crown prince, and he became uh, crown prince and the de facto ruler. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in 2017, in July 2017, he just—I think he, July or June—he'll he, be marking two years, uh, like very soon, or he just did. 
so when he became the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, he uh, uh, wanted to promote or present uh, three projects that turned out later to be just uh, a PR kind of campaign uh, to the West to uh, let him do what he, whatever he wanted, because that's what he wanted. Uh, he, he, the, the social project was to liberate women, to empower women. And in that project, he started, before even allowing women to drive, uh, he started by attacking the very woman that uh, campaigned for uh, women Sorry. to drive for the past two decades. Like Lujain ibn Lul, Aziz al Yusuf, I know a lot of them, and a lot of them were even colleagues or friends of mine. Uh, and he arrested them. Lujain still languishes in prison, and she, she suffers. Uh, <coughs> some physical uh, problems because of the torture, sexual harassment, <coughs> sexual harassment, and all that. And 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 because he did not want these leading uh, figures in social movement to take credit for their own uh, mm -hmm. struggle, he wanted to use that struggle for the West to do a PR campaign to uh, you know make the West allow him to. To to uh, to change whatever uh, dynamics in, in, in the in the Saudi uh, society, and that would allow him to just uh, uh, you know uh, rule unchecked and without any uh, you know uh, control from anyone. Uh, that was the first project. The second project was uh, an economic project to diversify the Saudi economy. It's a noble. Uh, objective to diversify the Saudi economy, to not be addict, addicted to, to oil, and to have uh, more uh, industry investment uh, being brought into the Saudi uh, market. Before he did that, he arrested the leading uh, economist of Saudi Arabia, like Islam <laughs> Zamil, my friend. Yeah, he did. Islam Zamil, uh, Jamil Farisi, and he uh, silenced uh, the others like Al Umari, like uh, Al Dakhil, Abdul Aziz Al Dakhil, and Burgess Al Burgess, who were, who, I mean, a lot of them were even uh, close to him at some point. And they, uh, they agreed and praised the Vision 2030, the vision, the plan that the conference introduced in order to diversify the Saudi economy. So he's obsessed with those people who can really uh, uh, convince the public of these projects because those people were introducing these projects long before uh, you know MBS uh, came to existence probably and the third project and that's what now uh, comes to our issue was the uh, MBS's project of moderate Islam and guess who are the people who are leading figures uh, in, 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 in introducing moderate Islam in the Saudi society, who have been leading the campaign against extremism and terrorism in Saudi Arabia, who have been uh, building bridges to other segments of society, who have been uh, really influential and very popular. Just to, you, you said like 14 million followers following my father only on Twitter alone. Like, that's double than what the king has on his Twitter account. So, though, I mean, they, will, they are so frightened and so, uh, uh, you know, concerned of these people who have the popularity. The, and, and my father, I mean, poses uh, like a, a, a particular, uh, you know, threat to them because he has also the religious legitimacy. He has the authority. He is moderate. You can, I mean, nobody on earth can call him an extremist unless you just want to smear him and they want to do that all the time. Uh, he is, uh, you know, uh, build the bridges to all people. He is acceptable by the East, by the West, by the locals and by the international community. And that's, and that's why he is... Uh, for them, a threat. And add, add to all that, he is calling for a constitutional monarchy, meaning to uh, uh, he will absolutely uh, be, uh, you know, 
uh, concerned about the absolute uh, uh, the absolute monarchy that we have. He calls because he calls for the constitutional monarchy. He wants to have some checks and balances. He wants to have at least some kind of separation of powers kind of system uh, where uh, humor, uh, there are human rights and you know basic liberties and uh, everyone is is uh, uh, is protected. I, I, just before we get more in, in the world of ideas, there was a report that came out that. Saudi so plans to execute free scholars right after Ramadan, um, and we we know that the tri the the government has officially called for the execution of some men of order, and uh, the has a sentence been passed or you don't know. Uh, there were a couple of uh, hearings, uh, but. Uh, there are two theories. So there is there is a basic fact that we did not uh, officially know or see uh, a sentence being uh, handed out, uh, or handed down to, to 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 my family or to my father. Uh, but we heard of uh, a parallel a parallel kind of trial that could take place because of the restructuring of the judiciary that took place like after Khashoggi so that was alarming and and that's why when we heard the leak we thought it's possible but there is no substantiated uh, uh, evidence that uh, can, uh, I mean that can take that will take place like uh, definitely but we we thought it's it's possible uh, again what we uh, know is that a sentence should not be uh, should not have been, uh, or could not have been uh, passed through the the process that we are aware of, but it's possible that a parallel trial is uh, taking place as well. The passing away of Morsi in, um, raises something that in the human rights field we confront all the time. Um, people usually are not aware unless you work in the human rights field, people usually are not aware of how many human beings perish simply for mistreatment. You, you know, if you're kept in solitary confinement, you're not allowed visits, you're not allowed... Um, uh, you're kept also in very unsanitary conditions, you're not allowed proper medical attention, you're not... And on top of that, we, there are reports I'm sure that you've heard them that your, your father was physically mistreated uh, as well as uh, as well of, uh, as others connected at the same time the a report that came out that Kushner called MBS and told them yeah. don't do more executions right now hold off on executions because it, it could embarrass us. It could embarrass yeah. us. So yeah. is it? It's not because they, they care about him. It's not, <laughs> yeah. Which, so, so are we, I mean, there, there are several scenarios, right? They, they could hold your father like they did before for five years. So they could hold him for a number of years and then eventually release him. They could actually sentence him and when the political climate is possible, carry out the sentence. Um, and uh, they could also do what governments are very good at, and that's the slow agonizing death of prison. Uh, human beings don't fare well in, in solitary confinement, and there's so much research uh, to how they deteriorate very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. 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 And, and it breaks you down intellectually and physically. And, and what from, the human rights record that we have today is very alarming because there, there are people that perish in Saudi prisons all the time and we get very little attention. Um, where, do you know where your father is in these very possible scenarios and in these various scenarios? Um, we can't tell for one reason. We used to predict and <laughs> You see, he knows that as well, and Tagreed and those who follow the Saudi politics. We used to know and predict what the red line is. 
we used to predict what the borders are. Uh, we used to predict the the uh, the punishment uh, in Saudi Arabia. For example, in King Abdullah, you can say whatever you want, but you know they will do whatever they want, right? That's the Mubarak's. Uh, well, yeah, let, let them. Policy. Yeah, yeah let, let them say whatever we want. We yeah, do whatever. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so that's the. I mean, to to a certain level, and then uh, the last uh, years of King Abdullah, even that changed a little bit to uh, harsher and harsher uh, conditions. But uh, right now, especially, I mean, they requested the death penalty uh, on the 4th of September 2018. Uh, like three or four days after that, uh, in sub a very uh, like widely read uh, website news that is uh, now confiscated by the, the government, it's part of the government's news agencies, uh, published a fatwa that's speaking of fatwas and speaking of Salah al-Fazan specifically. Uh, uh, so, so published a fatwa that uh, uh, the ruler did not just, were not just, was not just allowed to kill dissidents, but he was <coughs> obligated religiously yeah, yeah, yeah. There was like three or four days. I will never forget that kind of uh, fatwa. And and uh, you know, they they published. And some people said they just republished a fatwa that Al Fuzan previously said. Whatever that is, the context was obvious. And Sahib uh, had the chance to say no. We didn't say that. Or they published it. It was official and uh, it was signed and all that. And then three weeks later. We know of Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. So I was I was communicating with Khashoggi. He's he's a friend of mine. We we shared panels together like in Washington, in Chicago, and elsewhere. We shared some projects, and he has. Uh, so I know him very well, and he he went to uh, the Saudi Council at Istanbul when he went there. I know now a lot of people. It's easy for a lot of people to say. Well, it's crazy for you, someone like you, with the, the baggage you have and all that, and then just to go to the uh, Saudi Council in Istanbul. Well, guess what? No, that it, it wasn't. It wasn't so obvious as we. I mean, no, there is a saying like in Arabic, al fitna idha aqbat la yarifu hayla kukama wa idha wa idha adbarat arafa kulun nas. Right? I don't know. I don't know. How do you translate that? It's like. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try. Yeah. So they said uh, the, the, the disputed uh, uh, consequence uh, would not be, uh, would not be uh, uh, predicted, predicted, but only by wise people. But when that happened, a lot of people thought, yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was like, obvious. Like consequences are obvious after the fact. Right. The, uh, only wise people could see the, the, the consequences before when they occur. Common, yeah. mm. but Everyone can can pontificate about the consequences after the fact. Yeah, it's like revolution. When uh, I think uh, Dorkin once said, uh, revolution uh, is 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 uh, impossible until it, it happens. When it happens, it's inevitable. Yeah. Because a lot of people say, well, yeah. I mean, the the, the elements were there. It's <laughs> obvious. I mean, it's gonna happen anywhere, and you, you can see it. The elements are there. The conditions are there, and uh, the leading facts were there. So anyway. So a lot of people say, well, Khashoggi, it was obvious why Khashoggi would go to the Saudi Council of Istanbul. Because it was never, it, it was unprecedented. Because we never thought the Saudi government would go this far. But that happened anyway. So after Khashoggi, I mean, the Khashoggi incident was not just, uh, was not just a gross killing of, of an innocent guy, a journalist. It was, it was also a, 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 a how, what is it? It's like uh, a tafsiri, tef, it's an interpretive uh, uh, tool to understand uh, the work of the government, right? The, the very reasoning of the government, the behavior of the government, the, how they uh, react, and, and how, how they, how they uh, you know, deal with the people. Uh, has, Saudi, has Saudi Arabia ever executed someone of the stature and caliber of your father? Uh, not in the Sunni uh, Shia. 
Yeah, yeah there is like an immigrant in the Shia. Yeah, who, who is yeah, very but, No, huge, Sunni, but... no, it never happened, but also something <clears throat> like what happened to Khashoggi was never, uh, mm. you know, was, was never expected. <coughs> so that's, that's the, the horrible and frightening uh, element to the... There's so many... What? We know that some of the charges against your father and, and is that he purportedly was supportive or even a member of the Ikhwan. Yeah. And Muhammad bin Zayed and MBS seem to have a, a, a big oh, obsession should. with the Ikhwan. They, they hate the Muslim Brotherhood with a passion. Um, what is this Muslim Brotherhood thing? I mean, it, uh, for many years, Saudi and other Gulf countries acted as a haven for persecuted members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, w when they were persecuted in Egypt, it, it was the Gulf countries that, in, that right. embraced them. But, yeah. I think your friend <coughs> once the Saudi or the Khwan Muslim. It was. I mean, that yeah. book. Yeah. That book was. Al Hal Islam. And that yeah. book was dis distributed in in, in 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 Saudi schools, and now it's banned. Mm -hmm. in the kingdom. So Jamal. Subhanallah. Yeah. Now it's banned. He, he now it's banned in the kingdom. Yeah. A friend of mine told me like he worked uh, in a in a in a library in a Saudi uh, school. <laughs> He said, like, they came and they uh, took the, the book away. So it's, it's banned. It, it, it's, it, it's a little bit, it needs a little bit of unpacking because the Muslim Brotherhood, I mean, even Qaradawi cannot really be considered an official representative of the Ikhwan anymore. Right. Uh, the idea of the Ikhwan is so diffuse. Um, and there are so many variations on the theme <clears throat> that when they say we, we, we hate the Ikhwan, we hate the Muslim Brotherhood, we're going after the Muslim Brotherhood, it's, it's not clear who, who they have in mind. They're after, yeah. Well, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood was just a scarecrow that they use in order to crack down mm. on people. Because if they say, to people and say to uh, the people outside that we are cracking on the people because we want to have an absolute authority. Mm. Nobody would, would support them. Nobody would, you know, uh, would uh, would would uh, uh, you know be part of their uh, project. And, and, and will will never uh, will never pack. Uh, they'll never back their uh, own governance. Uh, but what they did is that they used the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, as a scarecrow for the people. Whatever, whoever half, uh, I mean, even Khashoggi once said it. He said, I heard of those uh, brotherhood. Uh, if we did a great things, they said brotherhood. When people, uh, you know, win elections, they said brotherhood. When people defend uh, human rights, they said brotherhood. When people, he said, who are these great brotherhoods that I want to be part of? Yeah. <laughs> they seem to be... <coughs> So they, they, they just they attribute the great things to the brotherhood that even some of the brotherhoods do not you know attribute to themselves. Uh, yes, of course, uh, there are people who are brotherhood, but the vast majority of of, 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 the, of uh, those who are called the brotherhood were was was either never part of the brotherhood or uh, are not now uh, brother. I'll just give two examples of, of what, uh, I mean, uh, MBZ, MBS, and those, uh, you know, uh, devil people call it brotherhood. When, for example, the, uh, the, the uh, uprising erupted in, in, in Sudan, it was against what was, uh, a, 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 what it was against a government that was at some point part of the part of the, part of the country, yeah. But nonetheless, they supported the government against the uprising, and they called the uprising the Brotherhoods. Now they call the, I mean... So it's like the, the, the Ikhwan is just a symbol for any disliked party. Any, any popular 
chance for democracy, for human rights, for basic you, you, you teach Islamic political thought. I mean, can we say that the Muslim Brotherhood stand for a set of ideas? <clears throat> Are there a set of ideas that represent the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, the, the original Brotherhood, yes, they have like, uh, they have an organization, they have, uh, you're, you're talking about the general look of Saudi Arabia. In, in general, just at the current historical moment, it, is there a, a bank of ideas that belong to the Ikhwan? What they now call Ikhwan is a very, very, Amorphous. yeah, it's a very, very large uh, umbrella to whoever uh, speaks and who has also either sometimes uh, who has the Islamic preference. Mm -hmm. And so, did Salman Rada ever belong to, to the Ikhwan? No, he once belonged before like uh, the before the nineties, if any, to uh, uh, an organization called uh, the Sururi organization at that time. The Sururi organization was. Uh, established by Dr. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi My father became even much, much larger during the 90s, let alone now, larger than the Sururi organization itself and, be, and, and the Sahwa movement and the Islamic Awakening movement became even larger than that, that, uh, that, uh, that contained at that time the Khwan, the, the, the Sururi, and some Salafi and some even non-Salafi. So he was part of uh, the Sururi movement. The Sururi movement in the in the 80s and early 90s uh, was a, a, was a movement that combined the Brotherhood mobilization and the Salafi uh, doctrine, the Salafi doctrine in like aqidah and how how they liked uh, the, the the concept of Tawheed, uh, unity of God, and all that. Uh, they took from Muhammad ibn Wahhab and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim. Uh, but at the same time, they combined that to the brotherhood uh, mobilization and how they reached the public and how... So that, that was the, the, the Sururi movement. But, okay, so we, we often what we hear all the time is that, well, what MBS and MBZ are getting at is that, and, and we hear this also from CC in Egypt all the time, that what we're getting at is, is is political Islam. That this is what people like al Oda, people like Morsi, uh, people like whoever, uh, what they represent is political Islam, and political Islam is part and parcel of the Ikhwan. So what is political Islam? That's, uh, well, it's it's ironic that those who try to attack what they call political Islam were the most politicizing forces of Islam. They politicize it in a way that is against the people, not for the people. So what they really after uh, was, was the Islamic uh, concepts that defends the people, the Islamic concept that defend the basic rights and, and, and dignity of the people. And that's what they uh, were after, because they are. I mean, take the example of uh, of uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia. UAE just, uh, I mean, Saudi Arabia just held a conference like last month, and they invited uh, uh, hundreds of Muslim scholars to defend certain ideas. And in that conference, they end, they they produced a document. They call it an Islamic document. And that was uh, adopted by the state, by the Saudi state. In that document, the 29th article of that document uh, literally says that nobody can speak for Islam or about Islam, but those people who attended this conference or people in a similar conference with the similar people and similar faces. So that's just the... the they are trying to make up a church with an mm. Islam that has that has the same hierarchy, uh, monopoly of interpretation, and they wanna. That's the politicization of Islam. That's the political Islam, the bad and negative political Islam. So why they are against political Islam if that's not 
political Islam. I mean, if that's not political Islam, so I don't know what political Islam is. It's like uh, it, it, they're trying to, the Catholicizing of Islam, they, they, right. they, they, they want a Catholic Islam, but with the caveat that the, the, the Catholic equivalent, the, 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 the church that is under the control of the state. Exactly. And they, and they call the, the popular calls for uh, political participation, for example, a political Islam, because it has that Islamic reference in it. That, uh, that, that, uh, the calls that, uh, that, that are supported uh, by uh, texts, uh, Islamic texts and Islamic scholars, because you are an Islamic authority and you are calling for political participation, you are politicizing Islam. But those who uh, religiously justify the killing of dissidents, those who justify the absolute authority and the absolute monarchy, those who justify the uh, cracking down of protesters uh, in Sudan, Algeria, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, elsewhere, were not politicizing Islam. So, you know, this has always driven me crazy. I did my doctorate about rebellion in Islam we, we, and wrote an entirely dense book about it, the Islamic law of rebellion. And it is well established that in Sharia law, anyone that rebels, the act of khuruj, either cannot be ta'weed. If you have a ta'weed, then the ruler is not allowed to kill you, and even not of money. Yeah, even what you what you end up destroying in the act during rebellion, you, you're not supposed to compensate for it. So, in fact, in the, in, in, in Sharia, a a rebel that has a cause. Right. So, in other words, it's not just an anarchist, but has a cause. And regardless whether the cause is right or wrong, is actually protected. And in, in the book, I want to go great pains to document about opinions, whether you can even imprison them or not imprison them, whether you can imprison them uh, 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 as a precautionary measure, uh, but, and whether you can even uh, inflict any form of ta'zir on them uh, other than killing. So whether you can you know, whip them, whether you can imprison them, and so on, whether you can exile them. And, I never hear from Egypt to Saudi Arabia to the Emirates, I never hear any Fuqaha talk about Ahkam al -Buha. I always talk about, I hear them talk about the Reset from corrupting the earth yeah. and the laws of the, Hiraba. That's the first chart, by the way. Yeah, yeah corrupting. corrupting on the earth, which is under the laws of Hiraba, which it, the laws, of, it doesn't apply. But I, I mean, I'll tell you the, that book there. There was one attempt to translate the book I wrote about Ahkam al-Bughada, the, the Law of Rebellion, to Arabic, and uh, it was banned in Egypt. Um, the, the translation was, was banned, the, the, the material was confiscated by Amnid Dawla, and then it, it, the book itself, it, it, you could go to prison, if your cut was that book, although it was published by Cambridge Press, you could go to prison for a very long time in Egypt. You could be, you could be considered, uh, could could be considered an act of rebellion. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you accept from Ardan itself. <laughs> but it, 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 it astounds me because <laughs> you think that these people have read fiqh and have read enough about the law of Haraba and enough about that, and they know that al mutawil la yuqtal, wa la wa la yadman, wa la yuhlasa. You can't you. Person was 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 a was a cause. Even if the cause is wrong, you can't imprison them. You can't punish them. You can't kill them. So it's a black hole of Islamic jurisprudence. It's uh, yeah. It's really saddening that how they uh, try to select and pick and present what uh, what their jurisprudence is, and and at the same time uh, accuse others of politicizing Islam. They are using uh, selectively texts from Fulk in order to uh, 
justify the crackdown, to justify uh, oppression on people. I mean, the, how they, how they, uh, for example, uh, dealt with the with the case of Sudan was really, really uh, brutal. Yeah, it, they 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 supported the military. They sent uh, they sent even uh, uh, cars in order to help the military crack down on the protesters, uh, and they called the protesters. Uh, Ikhwan and political Islamists and all that, and at the same time, they are using the general, uh, you know, idea, general uh, jurisprudence uh, doctrine of uh, disobeying the ruler in, in order to religiously justify the crackdown. Some have, some are saying that what, what MBS and the the countries of the Emirat want. It's that they have a secularization. They want to secularize Saudi. They want really and many. They want to secularize the Emirat. And people like Salman and all that is a lump in the throat in the process of secularization. So, and, and, and a lot of people, the, the secular, pro secularization people, say, well, you know, it's time we get rid of these backwards reactionary people because we need to join the modern age. And it's a secular revolution. And the real point is to get rid of these religious symbols that have kept us locked up in the dark ages. Do you, do you see the project as a secular project? Is Saudi and Iran being secularized? I think what, what the Emirat and Saudi uh, are doing uh, is the Catholicization of, of mm -hmm. Islam, not the secularization mm -hmm. of Muslim society. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, I mean, it depends on what you mean by, uh, by, by secularization. But if they meant like uh, having the basic rights and they call that uh, secularization, well, we have seen the how how uh, they moved in the other direction. Uh, if you mean secularization, separation of the state and church, well, I don't think uh, having uh, a supported and uh, state-sponsored uh, council of fatwa that issues fatwas against uh, uh, various segments of society is, is a secularization. I don't think that 29 article that I just mentioned last month, I'm not talking about like many years ago, last month that they uh, invited many scholars around the, the world to is, is, is uh, a secularizing uh, uh, force. I don't think, I don't think there is, uh, I mean, if there is any secularization that they, they really succeeded in, uh, is only the, the, the kind of secularization that uh, Tunisia during uh, before Ibn Abu mm. was the assertive uh, secular secularization that uh, succeeded only in silencing people and in in, in presenting a, a certain discourse religious discourse to be adopted by the people and a secularization that bans uh, religious sam symbols uh, uh, on public but at the same time uh, you know. And also, a uh, uh, secularization that asked people not to fast during Ramadan, so forcing people not to fast. Uh, you know, yeah. So, so that's intervening in the in the exercise of religion. That is against any, uh, you know, interpretation of uh, secularization. For example, in in, in in Canada or in the U.S. Just the first. You know, I want to ask you. So, you know, we, we I grew up with the idea that Saudi population is a religious population. I sometimes see Saudi accounts say things that are really shocking, including cursing the prophet, cursing the 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 you know, demeaning Islamic history, demeaning Islamic achievements. Is Saudi Saudi population moving away from religion? Is it true that 
it, there's a sort of social anthropological change in Saudi uh, where people are just a good size of the population are fed up with faith. No, I don't think. Uh, may, yeah, there is there is like a, a very small uh, segment of of the Saudi society uh, that uh, that really fed up not not of not not by not because they they they, they hated faith, but because they hated the faith adopted mm. by the, the, the Wahhabi strict uh, type. By the, yeah, and by Islam. the state, and, and I know personally, I followed one case, who, who I mean, the Saudi case, who, who uh, you know, denounced Islam and became uh, an atheist. And when I heard all of his like interviews, and uh, you know, he, he he never wrote anything, but uh, he did like a lot of interviews, like three or four. And he, I mean, that was like uh, forty four years ago. What he criticized in Islam was not Islam itself. He criticized the exercise of the Saudi government that was presented as, as, as Islam or as part of Islam. He, what, he, what he converted to was not Christianity or uh, atheism or Judaism. What he converted to is, uh, was, was uh, democracy. So he converted from absolute authority or absolute monarchy or absolute uh, or, or uh, unchecked power to uh, to to uh, democracy. So what he hated was that was these practices that he saw. In the, in the, I mean, take the example of the uh, the male guardianship system uh, in Saudi Arabia. That I mean, now the the, the Saudi government is it trying its best, while at, at the same time, ironically, uh, saying uh, it's in power and women, trying its best. <coughs> To, to, to protect that uh, system, to protect the male guardianship system, and to present it, to present it as, as, as part of Islam, as, as the qawamat al-rajul al mar'a and all that. But that system, if you, if you, if you read it, uh, like its history, it just started in 1982 or 1981, when one princess uh, fled Saudi Arabia, so the, yeah. the, the king... The, the, the famous story of the, the execution of... Right, the, um, right. So they, they yeah, did not the want the... such a, a story to uh, come up again. And in order for that to happen, they wanted to uh, infor uh, to enforce kind of uh, a, ba a, ba a ban on uh, female uh, going out of the country unless they have the male, male consent guardian. or yeah. the male guardian. Uh, consenting to 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 her. Uh, yeah, in that well, story, there was a Saudi. Just for people who don't know, there was a Saudi princess who went and married a Lebanese guy. Uh, I think he was a British Lebanese. Yeah, British actually. Lebanese, and uh, without the consent of her family, and it ended tragically. He was executed. She was executed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, extrajudicial. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, it was made into a band movie called The Death of a Princess. Right. It's it very hard, fi hard to find that movie. Uh, yeah. I, I watched it uh, smuggled in a basement because <laughs> even in Asia it was dangerous to watch this movie. Uh, you could get arrested, so we, we watched it as if we were taking drugs. You know, like, <laughs> sh close the we close the curtains, close the door, you know, lower the volume. Uh, to see the Death of a Princess movie, which, I mean, when you look back, back at it, it's funny, but at the time it was very scary. We, we were, you know, very worried that at any time Amnidala was going to come in and take all of us. Yeah, so the, the, the male guardianship system was introduced into the, the Saudi system after that incident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then later to justify that, they used, of course, the scholars again, and they used the doctrine of Al-Qawama, uh, they used uh, some texts, and uh, uh, so so when people hate that uh, system, when females run out of that system, when female uh, uh, want to flee that system, they think they flee in the Islamic concept of Qawam, mm -hmm. the Islamic concepts that justify that uh, that oppression and that system. So that's why they, they associate, and at the same time, they are now saying they are secularizing. 
there, okay, so we, we talk about the, 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 how vague the concept of Ikhwan is, which, I mean, unless you're talking about an Ikhwan within a particular administrative structure, you know, the Ikhwan of Egypt, organization, organize, a very specific organization, the, uh, most of them are in prison anyway, you know, in the case of Egypt. And they and, say they are Ikhwan, they are not. They and are they not, don't hide yeah, it. Yeah, they're open about it. They are Ikhwan. And, and, and those who are Ikhwan, they say they are Ikhwan and they are very proud of it and it's nothing wrong with it. And those who, who are not, I mean, it, 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 the funny thing is that, it, you know, I get accused of being Ikhwan all the time and, and I just never belong to the Ikhwan. Uh, I mean, partly because I can't work with any good organization. I mean, I can't work with an, an organizational structure. I'm too wild, I'm too crazy, uh, you know. I, my, my, I, 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 in some ways, like your father, I'm struggling with a new idea every every night. Every time I read a book, I'm, I'm struggling with a new idea. So, but we also talked about political Islam. We and and how that's also vague. But there there is. I want to introduce everyone to this argument that listen, the new Islam that is being woven in the post-Arab Spring period is Jami or Madkhali Islam, an Islam that basically says you should busy yourself with perfecting your Salah, with the rules of Wudu, uh, segregation between men and women, and the various rules of Hijab, uh, but in all cases, the biggest haram is to disobey ulil amr, to disobey those in power. And of course, Madkhari Islam uh, had its origins, but that it was vigorously embraced by the state and nurtured and promoted by the state. And that people like Salman Rauda, the, the, the problem is, is that they they throw a wrench in the hegemony of new Madkhali, Jami Islam all over the Muslim world. What do you think of that? Well, yeah, yeah it's very true. And, and, and the Saudi government supporting that religious uh, movement of Jami, if we call it movement, uh, is just another example of how they used Islam and how they politicized Islam and at the same time calling uh, other people uh, political Islamists. The Jami, uh, the Jami movement was uh, established in the 80s as a, respond, as a response to the, to the Islamic awakening at that time. And a lot of people said Muhammad Zaman Jami, the founder of that mo movement, was uh, naturalized in Saudi Arabia in order to yeah. Because he wasn't uh, a, yeah. a natural Saudi. Yeah. Thank you. In, in order to uh, to attack Sahamun, because it, it it was getting very big, very big at that time, and bigger and bigger uh, by time. So they needed uh, a within movement that can really challenge. Uh, but the, it, it not it did not succeed in a way that uh, the Sahamun movement got larger and larger and, and, and uh, probably became the lar large, very large umbrella uh, in Saudi Arabia <coughs> containing religious circles and people and scholars and all that. But after the, uh, and after the 2000, when uh, my father uh, got out of jail and uh, some other scholars and some other uh, uh, intellectuals as well, the Jami became very weak because they were uh, confronted with the idea. It's like when they, it's like when, uh, but, but with, with, with so much differences, uh, when, 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 uh, when some Islamists became part of power yeah. in Egypt. So they have the idea of... Uh, They're like, also Makhari and Jami, the, 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 the ones that support the military government in Egypt. Yeah, true. Yeah. They supported the military everywhere. They, I mean. Do you know that there are Jami uh, military forces in Libya fighting with Haftar? 
So they are so they their basic doctrine is to obey the ruler, to obey the, to to follow the status quo, to justify whatever whoever is in power, in power. But at the same time, they are actively fighting uh, in Libya with one uh, with one militia, with the Haftar militia, against the other militias. That just blows your mind how these people, uh, you know. But let me read the response I get from Germans. Uh, is that that's because democracy is haram. Democracy kuf bawah. And the, the problem with Salman al Oda is he didn't realize that democracy is kuf. And, and so the priority is to keep bid'ah al democracy out. Yeah, but the thing is that what, what was, I mean, Democracy is not found in the in the same text. It's it's a, it's a concept that was uh, very much later developed, right? But what we found in in, in the Quran is how bad the Malakia is, yeah. and they never fought Malakia as harsh as they did uh, to democracy. In in Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in, uh, when when uh, Malikat Saba. إن الملوك إذا دخلوا قرية أفسدوها وجعلوا أعزة أهلها أذلة. Nothing more. Translated for the the benefit of just it translated by meaning. Yes. So the meaning of that verse is that the the queen of Sheba said as a last time. Queen of Sheba. Sheba. Yeah. Sheba. Yeah. Sheba in in Yemen said in the Quran that kings. When they uh, when they go to town, they turn it upside down and they ruin it and, and they, they grow it. and they spread yeah they uh, spread uh, they oppress spread. it's they oppress the people I mean in, yeah. in, in essence yeah yeah so so they never mentioned that very obvious verse but they try their best to make up interpretations to attack uh, democracy to attack because they hate I mean. The real intention is to attack the popular movements. Uh, they they hate uh, uh, distributing powers because that I mean they have their own interests. Their interests uh, are so much associated with the uh, with the elites that rule the uh, the Arab regimes, and that's why they fight in their best. Uh, are they? Are, are, is, is there there's some people that become anthropologically accustomed, excuse me, to feed off power. They're like bottom feeders. You know, you have the sharks and yeah. the, shark, the, the, the the bottom feeders that rely on the futat, the, their, what the, the shark leaves. And one way, is, I always imagine the Jamis and, and the Medkhabis as, uh, you know, they, they leech on to power and they bottom feed. It's like, and the, the they always want a very strong and brutal power. Uh, I, I want to open up. Uh, there's so much we, we, we could. I mean, I, uh, there's so much we could talk about because there's. Uh, but we're not going to be able to touch on everything. But you know, there's still the issue of liberalism and can, is it coherent to talk about Islamic liberalism? And there's. Can we say that your father represents a, a, a liberal Islam? But I'm gonna, um, for the interest of time. I want to get to two main points, prior, prioritizing issues. We, it's very difficult to miss the way that so many Muslim countries have opened up to Israel have tried to liquidate the Palestinian issue to the point that UNRWA, the, the organization that's supposed to, from the UN, that's supposed to take care of it, has been having a, a, having a very difficult time meeting its financial obligations because we don't give it money. Uh, and in, in, whether it's Egypt, Saudi, the Emirat, the Oman, Bahrain, there, there is this, this, there's this rush to become 
Muslim Zionists, Arab Zionists, and uh, people like Salman al Oda is in the way because Salman al Oda consistently talks about how there has to be a Mashru Arabi, an Arab project, and that that Arab project can never embrace Israel because Israel, is, by definition, will undermine it. It's a, it's a, it's a, Israel can exist as a superpower in the region, but cannot share power in the region. And any other superpower in the region, Israel will seek to destroy. Um, and that's, that is often, I mean, those who dare say that openly are very few. But what, what, what do you think about that? They, that in fact, we can't really understand why Salman Rada is in prison and people like Salman Rada unless we also understand this, this new colonial Zionist project. Sure. Well, one of the very important things that uh, the current uh, administration of Saudi Arabia is trying to do is not just to normalize with Israel. Because, you know, let's say it's easy to just go and invite the Prime Minister of, of, uh, of Israel and just uh, open up to, to Israel and, and, and say we are, you know, uh, now normalizing with Israel. But the most difficult part in that idea is to conv convince the public, because the public is always uh, pro-Palestinian uh, uh, cause. Uh, they're always uh, with the with the Arab project, mm -hmm. with the uh, Muslim issues. Uh, they have been so much uh, oriented and, 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 and educated in the in the issue of Palestine and the issue of. Uh, uh, Al Quds in the issue of Al Aqsa in the in the, in the and we grew up even uh, taught in schools in universities and uh, circles in mosques everywhere that uh, we, we have I mean we have been told and seen uh, the pictures different pictures even of, of I remember like when I was really uh, a real like kid in in in, in uh, Mahad Al Almi the institute scientific institute where they showed us like a map of Jerusalem and they trying to say well this is uh, uh, Al-Quds and here is Al-Aqsa and here is Qubbat Al-Sakhra and don't even uh, you know mix up uh, Al-Sakhra with Beit Al-Maqdis because if you try to reduce you know the rest of Al-Aqsa to just Qubbat Al-Sakhra they will just they will take the data mm -hmm. away and then you know it's, it's an idea of how they, they <laughs> They try to educate you. Educate your consciousness about what the... the, the about even the small details yeah, of the yeah. map of not just Al-Quds, but also the Masjid Al-Aqsa itself, and the different part of it. Uh, so imagine growing up like not just one generation or two or three, like the whole Saudi society is always like, uh, uh, in the vast majority, pro-Palestinian cause and uh, uh, against the occupation, uh, Against uh, the, the, uh, the taking taking uh, the, the different part of Palestinian uh, territories. So so that was that was the the, the 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 Saudi context. With that, they are faced with how to change the how to change the 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 uh, conscience of the Saudi society into uh, you know. Israel friendly, but, friendly culture. But, but why? I mean, what? What is? What about MBS? He's supposed to be Khadim al Haramain, or the upcoming Khadim al Haramain, right? The servant of the. What about MBS makes him so eager to open up and normalize with Israel and liquidate the Palestinian issue and forget Jerusalem? What he, is going on? He usually has two things, two points in his mind when he uh, tried to normalize with Israel. One is that he thinks that uh, normalizing, uh, he thinks that the relationship with Israel is the way to uh, buy the West, is a way to convince the West, and is a way 
to make the West just uh, uh, ignore whatever he does in Saudi Arabia and in the region. And, and if he does any catastrophe, like he, he does all the time, he will find a way to calm that down and calm the West down and to try to uh, buy the West silence through Israel. And he does that all the time. And, and, and like what Assisi uh, did yeah. in, in several occasions. Yeah. Uh, the other point that he has in his mind is that he's so obsessed with the uh, with the Iranian influence right. uh, surrounding uh, the, the surrounding the Gulf, and for him to fight uh, Iran, you have to side with Israel. You have to use Israel. You have to convince Israel to, for example, strike. Iran, or, or to be uh, against Iran's Iranian uh, influence in Syria and Yemen, elsewhere, and and that's why he uh, he, he thinks that uh, normalizing with Israel, with, and he also thinks that I, I've seen. I used to have a friend who is uh, who is now right now a very close associate to him, is believe it or not, and he once said, yeah, and he once said. Uh, to me, and we had a very heated argument. And he, he said in the argument, "Well, believe it or not, and and do you agree or not, uh, Israel is is part of uh, our region. We have to admit that, and we have to make peace with it, and accept it, and normalize with it, because that's how things uh, work." And when I so I just responded to him, "Well, why you don't think uh, that way with the, with the Iran Iranians. as well?" <laughs> Mm -hmm. Iran wasn't wasn't Iran part of the world? Wasn't Iran a regime that existed long time before <laughs> any one of us in the Gulf countries existed, <laughs> let alone Israel? So he said no, but they are uh, they are uh, inimical to us and they are trying to provoke us here and there. And so Israel what about what about Israel? <laughs> is, isn't she, isn't Israel also? Like striking Gazans and you, 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 I, I, I'm going to ask you two, two, two quick questions. Then we should open up because I know that I. But I, I you know, the reality is, and I'll, I, I'll ask the two questions and I'll let you uh, have the final one. The, the reality is that we have people. Uh, uh, look, you can't go back to Saudi. Yeah. You know, if you go back to Saudi, that's the last we'll ever hear of you. Um, and that's that's probably a hundred percent sure. Uh, and like I can't uh, go to Hajj or Umrah uh, the minute I step have a step foot in the airport. That will be the, the last one. Uh, so effectively, your new society is the U.S. Your 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 your. Inshallah. Uh, You'll have children in in the U.S. You, so you you're going to become part of the American Muslim reality. The reality is, though, is that we have someone like Hamza Youssef, who is a, a part of the Emirati Fatwa Council, which begs the question: What is the responsibility of American Muslims towards this new reality? that is overflowing in the holy sites, Mecca and Medina and Al Quds. You know, how do you see that? What it, because that is a question that I think is a moral question that confronts all American Muslims. There's some American Muslims who went to that conference of the Emirat and who basically said, uh, 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 yes, we the Emirates and Saudi and MBS and uh, MBZ that that's that these are the leaders of Islam and it's haram to criticize them and, and so on. So that's the the, the, the other thing is, um, are you you're here in the states? Are you in danger? Um, I mean, it's silly I'm asking that because I also know that how dangerous it could become. Uh, um, but I've often wondered. It, it would you have a lot of family in Saudi, uh, and they're all not allowed to tr to travel. It, it, it takes you, every time you speak, every time you appear on TV, every time you teach, every time it, it, 
the the bill, the the cost, the price could be yeah. Yeah. enormous, um, and and it's important people to be aware of that because it's it, 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 it Muslims often don't realize the cost of bravery, the price of bravery, and and it's it's unduly. We ask a, a, a an element, a small element of society, to bear the in an in an unfair way the cost of bravery, while the vast majority, you know, just slides through without any bravery, if not even worse. So first, how do you see the role of American Muslims towards all these changes? And then, if you want to say anything about the the challenges that you personally meet and how you are handling them. Sure, I'll combine the two questions by saying that, uh, well, it's so, uh, it's so much easy for me and for so many others to just sit or try, try to be part of the, part of the gang and, and, and got a scholarship and got supported and promoted and uh, got praised uh, in Saudi state TVs or, or on state-sponsored TVs in general, uh, it's so much easier and, and, and financially much better to uh, just take that uh, easy path, easy path. But that's just uh, against everything that we, we learned. That just against the knowledge that we have been uh, taught with all, all, all our lives. Uh, but I, you always, any, uh, enforces that, but you always enforce the idea that uh, knowledge is not just uh, learning details and things, but it 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 it, it, it haunts you. It it takes. Uh, yeah, you'll be tested in, in in your property, your belongings, and in in your very selves inside yourself. Yeah, that's uh, uh, part of. Part of faith itself, uh, faith in general, faith in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and faith in religion, faith in justice. Uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala set this earth on justice, uh, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala built it on justice, and 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 to be just and fair for everyone, and fighting for that is part of the faith and religion, and and, and it's it's. You have the choice. That's what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said. Wahdinahun najdain, and we opened up the two paths for you. So, the one path, the easy path, is just to sit and stay, and you get money, you get job, you get uh, comfort from everyone. Or the other path, where you know you you will fight, you will always struggle, you will always be, uh, face. Uh, uh, challenges and, and, and challenges is just a very uh, uh, light word to describe it. Uh, but with these challenges, always uh, open up uh, new paths for hope. And, uh, You'll face uh, trials and tribulations, and often the tribulations are very severe. Very true. And, and, yeah. and uh, as Grace has today told you, that. Uh, about the, the, the other half and how to embrace everything and to look. Oh, the, the, that's uh, he's referring to half full, half empty. <laughs> I'm the half empty, Greece is uh, half full. <laughs> that's, what, that what, that's what Abdullah is referring to. Yeah. So, so go on, I'm sorry, to, I just want to clarify. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, to, see, to see through things is really important. That's when Allah subhanahu I remember like one of the very great scholars in Islam, I think Ibn Rajab, who said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just say, inna ba'd al-usri yusra, or qabla al-usri yusra. Allah said, ma'al al-usri yusra. It's not, Allah didn't say that. After hardship, there will be ease. Allah said, with hardship, there will be ease. Exactly. So accompanying that hardship, is the ease and the, the the new path for hope for new hope, so so we know that uh, these challenges. So for for the scholars uh, who, who who are now in exiles, uh, in exile, they have these two paths uh, to choose uh, and, uh, to choose, and I chose uh, the the other path. The hard one. Yeah, the hard one. 
And I know with that there will be a lot of challenges, there will be a lot of hardships, but inshallah I'll be uh, ready for that. And I know, and I, I'm, uh, the second question, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes threatened, intimidated, uh, they ask me to go back, I know people who are here in the States uh, who are followed even, mm. Uh, mm. or try to listen to, I know somebody uh, here in the States, I know like not somebody, like more than one was told by the authorities here that uh, they are uh, in danger. Mm. Uh, and, and so it's 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 a real uh, it's a real struggle and and, uh, and and that threat is sometimes physical uh, sometimes uh, electronic mm -hmm. electronic I mean uh, uh, like a friend of mine or as his his cell phone was hacked and they listened to his they wanted to uh, they tracked him they wanted to know and they tracked uh, his cell phone in his co and, and his communication with Jamal Khashoggi just before the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. So it's, I mean, hacking the cell phones was not just hacking cell phones, listening to you, and surveilling you. It's it's uh, it's really you know. Uh, uh, I just for people to, because people need to know this. I I know someone. Um, he apparently had a, a private uh, video on his phone of an intimate moments between him and his wife. So they hacked into his phone and the, they used the video, they contacted them, they said we have the video from your phone and intimidated him. Uh, I mean basically got him to uh, become a CC supporter mm -hmm. on their threat of releasing that video. So be careful with your phones, um, <laughs> what you put on your phones, they're, they're not safe. Um, <laughs> I, mean, it, it, I, I know this fellow, so uh, the, so, the story, and we, we, which I, it was very positive because he switched overnight, and I, I, was, I really wanted to know what happened. I mean, it just didn't sound like him, and it turned you out that he... You don't want to see me switch overnight. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, the way, and, and I'm now going to have questions as well, but I, I, I would say I pray and I really, in, in, throughout Ramadan, especially in Ashr and Awakhir, and, and especially after, after uh, Shaf al Wutr, I, I always yeah, do that, uh, that Allah removes the hardship from, from all political prisoners, but also that I. I see the day that your father is a free man. Um, I, I, I think an ummah, a, a nation, and we are a nation as Muslims, it, the amount of blessings, that the extent to which Allah answers the prayers of a nation is in direct proportion to the fate of its scholars and its Arabaniyun, the, the, the those who are closest to Allah, the men and women who are close to Allah because of their piety or because of their knowledge and so on, if they suffer and if they're persecuted and the Ummah just stands by and allows it, I believe that's the time that Allah says, I'm not answering your prayers. You don't deserve to have your prayers answered. I will turn away to a nation that <coughs> honors that dignifies my creation. And that, and, and, and so I take it in a very concrete way when I see the way that our most pious, our most uh, uh, um, knowledgeable are treated, I worry about the fate of the entire Muslim woman. And, and for me, it's a matter of that is, it, it symbolizes this, uh, this, this whole thing. Um, it, it is obscene, for me, it is obscene that he remains in prison. And if you want to put, exert any pressure, we turn to Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, and all our hopes hang onto human rights organizations, while Muslims themselves, it 
it's as if they're useless. Yeah. And and people go on with their Islamic conferences and their Islamic events and as if, oh well, you know, he's in prison. You could wake up one day and you know, Allah forbid, Allah forbid, but you could wake up one day and he's expired because he, you expire in prison. It's these are not humane conditions. These are not just another day. And then la'na uh, tidam. There's the curse that comes from blood that is shed unjustly. Um, and all of us suffer. All of us suffer the consequences. So I mean, I, I, my. May, may, uh, may Allah strengthen you and strengthen your family and, and, and give you peace and tranquility and may Allah unite you with your father uh, 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 so he even has an opportunity to see his grandchildren inshallah in, in due time they're, they, they're not, they don't exist yet okay uh, you, you, you handle the, uh, the, the Q&A okay uh, if, can I, actually I have, can I start? <laughs> I just um, thank you so much for sharing everything. Um, we should thank you for organizing this. And uh, you know, it's, it's, all it's, it's she's taking the first question. So yeah, this is <laughs> <laughs> that's her award. <laughs> that's f full payment. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions. One is I'm curious if um, on that council of invited Muslim scholars, like which Muslim scholars from America were part of that that conference. And then um, a second is um, just if you, like, what can people here do to help you? And have you had much support? So, you know. Well, uh, for the Muslim scholars, uh, I think as the uh, doctor said, yes, uh, part of, like, a Zaytuna group uh, went and, uh, uh, but also there is, there is uh, resistance to that. Mm -hmm. There's resistance. I know uh, a lot of scholars and people. There are people who haven't signed. Uh, they 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 wrote pieces and uh, you know analyses on how to react to such a conference, and uh, it was it was uh, there was a great uh, reaction to it too. Uh, there is for the uh, for the second question. Uh, for the first time yesterday, the. State Department in its uh, annual report on Saudi Arabia, they mentioned my father for the, f for the first time. They said uh, he has been uh, uh, detained and uh, uh, all the charges uh, were just his alleged uh, relationship to the Brotherhood and uh, and they talked also about other individuals and so they, that, that was, there was uh, I mean not a bad move uh, at the end after like two years and seeking death penalty against him and all he uh, had been through. Uh, the Human Rights Watch uh, like published two or three reports on him. Amnesty International have been, uh, have seen some of their reports on him. Uh, the UN talked about him. Uh, I'll be joining a panel uh, four days from now along with the uh, Anis Kalamar, the the mm -hmm. uh, reporter, on uh, reporter on, on from the UN. Yeah, she's on on uh, extrajudicial killing. Mm -hmm. the, she the, she authored the report on Khashoggi. Oh, right, right, right. She just did, uh, and with with Khadija, uh, the the fiance of. Uh, so there's yeah, and there are people like some some uh, more or less Islamic organizations who are. Uh, like who did some efforts and that's, these are uh, great. And uh, I know a petition that was signed by uh, uh, scholars here in the West who uh, condemned uh, the possible execution of my father. But uh, uh, still it's not this strong, you know, message and this strong, uh, you know, solid, Support that can really change the the uh, the Saudi government's you know uh, behavior. So it, it, it's going to be a strong and real 
pressure if this LD behavior changes because of that, because of it. So I don't know what's, I mean, we, I think they always, the Saudi government will respect only a pressure that is really high and can, you know, uh, put them in a tight position or a pressure from those who usually support them, which is the, the administration. So either, either choice can, can really change the, the situation. Other than that, it's a great pressure, it's a strong uh, message, but it's still uh, falls short, fall short from changing the condition in Saudi Arabia. Do you think if people stopped going to Hajj and Umrah as a statement that that would make any difference? I really don't know. It, it, uh, it needs uh, people to sit down and think that through and see if that can really... I've seen some people call for that, but uh, uh, I didn't have like a uh, position. Thank you. Go ahead. So I'd like to just um, uh, follow up with uh, just the, the note that you just, the observation you just made right now, and I'm glad you had made that observation. You had mentioned that the State Department had mentioned your dad in a report yesterday, and that's a good news. That's, that's an awesome news. Uh, my question to you is, uh, do you have any way of getting to the State Department? Because you touched on this, and you did mention that the Saudi authorities would only respond to those who could apply some sort of pressure on them. So is there any way you could uh, perhaps uh, contact them or lobby yourself and your cause through the State Department? Uh, so, so are you saying, uh, am I, or do I, or, or you suggest that I should? I think you should. Okay. Yeah, I, sure. I, I, my heart is for you. Thank you so much. I, I have four children, and, and, and I know yeah. how, how it feels. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, of course, a good advice. Uh, do you, do um, you have any contacts currently with the uh, State Department, or not really? Not a, like a real, con no, mm. not a direct real, but I, I know people who, who, who always tell me about it and always try to, yeah, to talk to the State Department, but uh, no. Amir? Thank you so much for coming here. I, I haven't read your father's writings and uh, I became uh, familiar with some of your father's scholarship through uh, Professor Bonfalo's um, mentioning of his ideas, and I definitely responded to his call of duty to go in, in a gathering in, in solidarity with your father a couple of weeks ago in front of the Saudi consulate in Los Angeles. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, what are the jurisprudential grounds uh, for your father's opinion uh, when he criticizes the duty of obedience, absolute obedience to the king or the ruler as part of the Wahhabi doctrine. My second uh, question is, um, of course we know that the uh, so-called movement, I mean a little movement that happened in 1979 in um, Saudi Arabia was mostly a, um, a, a, a adhere to a certain version of millennialism and uh, probably not not so um, progressive at the time. Did your father criticize that? I mean, the ideas behind that movement, or how, what was your father's re uh, 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 theoretical uh, reaction to that? Movement? Uh, for the second uh, question, sure. uh, more easier, the easier qu is is that he's, he's uh, yeah he criticized the you mean like the the, the militant that's right yes taking over of uh, Mecca, of Mecca yes. by yes. Juhayman al right, right, right. yes he criticized that in, in different uh, in in various uh, points and he he wrote on that. Uh, uh, what are the theoretical arguments that he made? Yeah, he said he he's like the general idea of uh, disturbing the peace by using military force against the people okay. is always uh, that's that's a real rebellion. That is uh, 
that's the the scholars traditionally uh, are against the disturbing the peace, uh, making a military uh, you know intervention uh, against the people against society. That's that was the the, the ground. Right. For, the for this first question, well, he always touches upon the idea that a uh, bayah, uh, uh, like uh, allegiance, is a two-way, uh, you know, ground. It's you have you have the conditions, and you have the the requirements. Uh, you have the 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 obligations upon the people to to uh, to. <coughs> Uh, obey, but you have also the obligations upon the ruler to uh, be fair and just, and to be criticized and to be corrected if they were wrong. So he has that like conditions of the bayah. So and he always says that the bayah is like the bayah. The bayah is like uh, derived from the from the same. From the same bayah and bayah were derived from the same uh, origin, bayah, bayah, wa So he said the bayah and bayah were a contract between two uh, individuals or two parties, and each individual has to hold up to their uh, end of the deal with them. Yeah, end of the bargain, and 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 the in, uh, and for the ruler. They have to uh, obey the general rulings of being just, of being uh, consultative, of being uh, fair to uh, and and to be uh, able to criticize. Uh, and and for the uh, for the uh, subjects or for the citizens to obey, they have to see the the other end of the body being being uh, honored. So he said that's that's the the idea, the concepts of the conditions of the bayah. The bayah is between two individuals. It's not like one way uh, uh, street where the ruler uh, like just requires anything upon the rules ruled, and and then they will just listen and, and obey. Uh, but it's two two party uh, contract, and also there is the concept of the conditions of the uh, of the allegiance. Did, did, I, did that did that make sense? Yeah, I would uh, uh, appreciate if you draw the distinctions between your father's um, oh. contractarian um, theory, which is very much upheld uh, throughout the Islamic tradition, legal tradition, right? Um, and the, the, the with ones. the one that the Wahhabi yeah. Salafi uh, theory is uh, offering, because I can assume that. Yes, the, the, the Wahhabi uh, doctrine would also start with this type of argument, but, yeah, but they there would, there would be some true. distinctions, true. of course. Yeah. yeah, they developed it into a way. Now the current like understanding of how the obedience to the ruler is is just to obey whatever the ruler says. Right. Uh, you, you do not criticize uh, the ruler. You do not engage in any kind of <coughs> negotiation or discussion with the ruler. Mm -hmm. You just obey. And even if the ruler, uh, for example, requires you to do an unjust and unfair thing, you have to do it because the ruler says so. So that's, that's just, uh, because they said, like, the ruler, uh, they, they always use the hadith, even if the ruler uh, take, uh, beats you and takes, yeah, your, beats money. You and takes your money or takes your positions. Your positions. But how do they rule away? Yeah, you and the Dinam and Ati Allah or Ati or Rasul, what Ulil Ambi Munkum? What Ulil Ambi Munkum? That's it's conditional upon Ta'ati Law, Ta'ati Rasul, like you said. Yeah, and also they said La Ta'ati Makhlukin. Yeah, they said they always said La Ta'ati Makhlukin. I mean, some of the like scholars said like La Ta'ati Makhlukin Masit al Khalaq. They said it's also. You have like they have the the, the lesser, uh, the lesser harm. Yeah, the lesser evil. Yeah, the lesser evil. Yeah, they said the lesser ever, uh, like 
evil uh, is to accept some even bad 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 religious stuff like requiring you to do bad religious stuff in order to just uh, you know save and protect the status quo because disturbing the status quo by criticizing or by by, by you know at, uh, you know uh, calling out the ruler will just make it uh, uh, I'm sure you, you heard uh, who was it that said um, well there were two two things that became one is that it is okay for the ruler to kill one third of the population yeah. to, sure. save the to save the other two thirds. And I think Stal Stalin acted up on that. <laughs> yeah, Stalin did that. But, but, and, and then there was another one that said uh, if the ruler fornicates on TV for yeah. half an hour every day. Uh, yeah, Aziz al Rais. No, Aziz al Rais. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he said that. He said that. Who's, and who said the first one? The, the one yeah, yeah. Salah, I think Salah al Haydan said. What is that? Salah al Sheikh, I think. Mool Mufti. Number Qarat Shah, right? Yeah. He was with the Sheikh al Sheikh Tani. Mool Mufti. Hey, Abdel Latif al Sheikh. Ah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's very hard. Who would want to be Muslim if, if they hear that in Islam it's okay to murder one third of the population and that, that, that Muslims wouldn't find that problematic? I mean, if you find it problematic, you are politicizing Islam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You and you're, you're politicizing and you're Juan. And you're, Juan. <laughs> and you're also, uh, you know, uh, asking rebellion against the. Uh, <laughs> that actually goes to a question that I want to ask. There is, there set, there seems to be a, a disconnect or a schizophrenia in the historical narrative of Saudi Arabia. Um, for instance, it began as a. Uh, Oh, first of all, the question is, is it a champion of Islam or is it a champion of modernism? So it started, it, it began as, as a renew, as a renewal message of Islam. The leader was called the Imam. And then it's, and then when it got recognized as a state, it, the leadership title went from Imam to Sultan, which is of both Islamic names, but then, titles, but then it became king. So, uh, which is not Islamic, and then it was named Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So, which is, if, if you go through it, it's supposed to be Kingdom of Islamic uh, Saudi, because they were not championing the, the Arabian part of it, there was Islamic part of it. Then, then we move on uh, until uh, Abdel Nasser's uh, revolution, when now, it, 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 when uh, the revolution on monarchy in Egypt, there, were, there was another injection of Islamicity in Saudi Arabia to form more legitimacy. Then it came with the Yemen war, the first ones in the 60s, where we championed the Mutawakkili uh, monarchy, although they were Shia. Yeah. Uh, then when the Iran thing happened, suddenly Shia became the, the enemies. So uh, it, this thing is whether are they championing Islam by itself or the institutions of monarchy? It, it seems that this is an important question that is not risen enough, whether for uh, international Muslims or, or for Saudi Muslims as well. So well, it, that's a fair question, and, and uh, that is himself. And just an, another example of what, we're, we're, what you were just uh, saying is the the, the case of uh, Ikhwan Mantalla. It's not not yeah. the brotherhood. Uh, Zekhwan mm. Ta'ala is another case. It's a, it's a very interesting case. Zekhwan mm. Ta'ala is a, like brothers of those who obey Allah. That's a mm. literal translation of the movement. It was uh, like a multiple militias established by King Abdul Aziz. And King Abdul Aziz uh, educated them and put them into uh, small towns called Hijras mm. in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in these uh, small towns, Abdul Aziz brought uh, Wahhabi scholars to teach them the unity of God and to fight for God and to fight those who, uh, you know, worship partners with Allah. And they meant at that time the other parts of the uh, Arab Peninsula itself, let alone those who are outside. 
Abd al-Aziz was educated there uh, uh, doctrinally and was also training them militarily. And as soon as they finished, uh, he made up of them the, the, the fiercest uh, militias in the Arab Peninsula. And with them, he uh, moved south and north and east and west. And he went uh, uh, to, and, and, and they diverged, uh, diverged only when, 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 uh, when Abdul Aziz entered uh, Hijaz and he became like the ruler of all these huge lands. And they noticed that Abdul Aziz went against the teachings yeah. that he taught them. <laughs> he was he was okay with the uh, Toms, what is it, Toms, the Toms, the Baraih? Oh, yeah, Toms, Toms, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was okay with the, with the Sufis, not okay, but he was, he did not fight them, like, with, with force. And uh, it was against the teachings that he taught them in order to fight uh, different parts of the Arab Peninsula. And then the Barakat Asbila happened. <coughs> they both fought. And he was able, like, uh, throughout his uh, military uh, journey, to to compose some kind of uh, an army, mm. like a national army. But at the same time, that like older militia existed, but it became like a thorn in, uh, to his uh, yeah, you know, back, yeah. yeah. And then he wanted to get rid of them, and then uh, Marcus Spiller happened with the Battle of Spiller mm. uh, happened, and they uh, they fought. So. The idea is, is the irony that in order for Abdul Aziz to rule the Arab Peninsula, mm -hmm. he used the ideological uh, uh, Wahhabi teachings that he taught these militias, mm -hmm. and he militarized them. And when he, when it became, uh, <coughs> you know, when it became uh, yeah. a liability. They used the British Air Force to slaughter them. Right, right. And, and then when, when you, you remember like the, the one quote, the famous quote when Abdul Aziz was asked by one leaders of that militias, uh, I think when Dweesh. Faisal Dweesh, when he asked Abdul Aziz, he said, where are you getting all this money from the, the British, the Brits? Mm -hmm. So they, they were like, they were wondering why Abdul Aziz has, mm -hmm. like, if we are fighting the Kuffar here in the Arab Peninsula, why you are siding? Why are you taking money and you are you are befriending the other kuffar in, in, in the UK and elsewhere? That's what they thought at that time. Yeah. So Abdul Aziz said uh, said no, that's not uh, money from them. I'm just taking jizya. Yeah. They're paying, <laughs> they're paying <laughs> tribute. <to Yeah>. Them. <laughs> they're paying jizya yeah. to me. Yeah. They said that that was the, the jizya. Uh, you know, uh, Philby. Uh, mock, I mean, writes about this, and he, he, he's laughing. That he's laughing about it because, of course, you know, when 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 the when we appear, when uh, Arabs appear to accept arguments like this, yeah. they always mock us. I mean, uh, Philby himself, I think, his whole conversion to Islam and so on was a big mockery. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it's. He, he was mocking Muslims in... Uh, yeah, he, he wrote like the, 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 the Saudi brothers on, the, on that militia. It was, it was on yeah. the Ikhwan the, the, Allah. But, but, but is it... Is it you, when I started out in the U.S., I remember when I used to... When I first started talking about the Wahhabi movement and the history of it, there was a certain Qutsiya, there was a certain holiness to pointing the finger at the Khadam al Haramin al Sharifin, you know, the, the guy, the, the, the servant of the Holy. How dare you, how can you criticize? The, the, they have the. the but, but isn't someone like LBS worried about the withering away of this? sanctity of this holiness that's what Khashoggi had been saying like for a year and a half he said to MBS I think personally and he said it later in the news many many times that uh, it's it's very much noble to present the modern Islam 
uh, very good, uh, but do not, uh, do not, uh, you know, lose that soft powers that you have because you are the guardian of the beautiful yeah. mosques. A lot of people are around the Muslim world will just listen to you because you have Mecca and Medina. Yeah. So it's either you have no choice. It's either if you are not using it, you are using it in a in a bad way, in a negative way. You're presenting uh, a role model that is against uh, the, the 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 enshrined rules of uh, of of justice and Islam. So he was saying that uh, uh, you have no choice. You have, I mean, Saudi Arabia was based on that mm -hmm. religious doctrine. So it's either it's either you use that uh, religious basis in a in a good way, promoting the moderate Islam, the inclusiveness of everybody, uh, the, uh, the the justice that has, that everybody is seeking, or uh, or else. That's, that's actually points to another form of that schism that is in the history of Saudi Arabia because custodian of the two holy mosques is not the original title. Yeah. It was a title yeah. adopted in the 80s yeah. because and the original title was His Majesty. Yeah. And there's, there used to be like a, yeah. a, an anecdote of why it was changed. It was when uh, I think King Thad at that time went to a visit to, uh, to the Masjid al-Nabu in Medina. And then the TV, uh, Isa, the TV anchor, he said that the, uh, the, His Majesty the King has blessed the mosque by his visit. Mm. And then the, the people like uh, mm. said, like, how could he bless the mosque of yeah. the Prophet? Yes. I mean, the, prof the Prophet's mosque blesses him. Yes. So they changed the title <laughs> from His Majesty to Custodian of the Two Holy Mosques, which is not a new title. It's, a, true, it's an Ottoman title. Yeah, yeah. It's, an old, it's a very title. old Ottoman yeah. title, naturally. He, 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 lift, he plagiarized it from the Ottoman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they, they, and then they attack the Ottomans. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, Zazen, go ahead. I have questions. As a non Arab, the only non Arab probably in Greece. <laughs> I'm really curious how 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 strong or how weak the Arab dissident who live in exile like you. I mean, because according to let's say to my Indonesian experience, people who live outside of the country can have a great impacts and influence to the change that uh, can happen inside the country when you have no possibility of making change from inside. Mm. So how how united do you? I mean, you are with your let's say. Do you have any organization? Do you have do you have united yourself to have more you know organized way to to make change? Uh, that's my first question. Second question: How people like you see the possibility of change itself? in your country, uh, particularly in Saudi, and in the region, in, 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 in a wider context. <clears throat> because as everybody knows, Arab Spring failed, and we could not uh, hope that regime can change himself. We're hoping that they can change themselves by seeing the world, you know, the world is changing, then they want to be moderate, they want to be you know, reform themselves, but as, as you say, it's more PR than the authentic, you know, uh, multi, uh, authentic effort from the, from the region. So how people like you see the possibility of change in, uh, let's say, in the next 20, 30 years? How is it possible if inside you cannot make any change and outside you are not united or less powerful and, let's say, powerless? So, uh, well, well. Uh, for the we don't have a, a, like a united front as Saudis. I'm talking like about Arabs in exile. Let's mm. say Saudis in exile. Uh, but we have we have a growing number mm. uh, of Saudis. Uh, we I mean I use not to see any Saudis like in, any Saudi in exile here, st especially here in the states mm. at all. Mm. And then Khashoggi became like probably one of the few. And then uh, it's a growing number with uh, Dr. Khaled Dosri, uh, 
mm. with people who I know. Now I know, like, I have a group of people, like, uh, of almost 12 people who are now outspoken, who those who are now uh, go, uh, who are, like, speak uh, in the news and can uh, speak in uh, at ban at panels on, on, on different issues. And so we have a growing number of Saudis here in the States. It's not a very solid movement and very solid, but it's, I think with their growth, they can make some kind of coordination and uh, uh, some kind of change. Uh, and we have like a larger number in Europe, especially the UK mm -hmm. is also like very growing. Uh, and we have in general, we have in Canada, uh, like uh, a few people as well, uh, so numbers are like we have in Australia, we have in New Zealand, we have now it's going like everywhere. After the program f of scholarship that mm. King Abdullah introduced, mm. and and then uh, King Salman almost closed, you got uh, like people Saudis like everywhere, and 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 those who 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 ended up seeing uh, like their society uh, being closed up like this will just stay at, at the, the, the you know their own um, yeah the, the, the countries that uh, they, 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 they went to and will make uh, their own community uh, in, in anywhere that they uh, went to so mm -hmm. yeah we have a growing numbers so a great number of Saudis uh, we are not so much uh, solid as you may suggest or want, but I think it's going, it's going to happen uh, at, 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 I mean, at, at one point in the future. Uh, for the second question, uh, will there be any change? I think, and that's where I uh, disagree with a lot of Saudis of them themselves, I think there will be a change uh, in the near future. But I cannot, I cannot, I cannot say when, where, and why. I still have that uh, optimistic uh, part, uh, and always optimistic. And I think the change, if if, I mean, at least that change will happen, because the 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 situation in Saudi Arabia is uh, unbearable, unbearable, mm. because uh, uh, MBS failed in every way and he succeeded in uh, not just polarizing so not polarizing Syria, but, but actually uh, antagonizing every segment of society mm -hmm. he is against uh, the Shias because you know there is a long history that he executed so much mm -hmm. I mean the so yeah mm -hmm. the execution uh, is is skyrocketing during the past just two years or three years mm -hmm. uh, you have the, the, I mean, the, 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 so much of the feminists have a grudge on, uh, to, to, because of, the, of how MBS treated the feminists and women rights, uh, women human rights defenders, female human rights defenders in Serbia. And the Islamists, of course, they have so much problem with MBS. And you have that uh, problem everywhere because he, he, he tried to, uh, try to chalk the, the, the public sphere. So mm. even the economists mm. uh, hate him because the plan is not working <coughs> very well. A lot of people, uh, I mean, the, the number of people, and, and that, I just heard like last month, people who said like uh, one of the close circle of MBS himself told him like in the past two months or so that uh, the youth are, are even like not happy. Uh, those even who go to, for example, dance in a concert, they also have concept, they have religion, they have their own. I once said, like, those who's, who, who, who dance in a concert this are the same people who say, who say, <laughs> who say, like, the scholars are the, the like, the... And you're, uh, uh, they, uh, yeah Superior to you, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the scholars... Are actually worth more than you. Yeah, so they, they, they really respect religion and Islamic values and, and, and believe it or not, 
I mean, I, I think the vast majority of those who go to concerts now that, that are taking place in Saudi Arabia are much more traditional than I am, or my father is, mm -hmm. <laughs> believe it or not. Because they are traditional. Uh, they they want to like enjoy their lives. That's what Ali Shariati once said. If the, if the Muslim society was to choose between a secular system or... Uh, or a religious system, they will vote for a religious system and they will go to live in a secular society. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost exactly what's going on. They are more traditional than I am. They are very religious. They, are, they respect the scholars. And, and they have the, that holiness for the scholars. They, they do not want you to criticize the scholars, even if they if they think they, they go wrong sometimes, or, you know. Uh, so I, I think the vast majority of society is very religious, uh, and they are provoked by, the, the, uh, uh, by some changes, at the same time provoked by the oppression and, you know, cracking down on different segments of society. So I think the, the situation, and also the, the only part that usually back MB, the only part, uh, I mean, the only uh, thing that usually impacts MBS, impacts MBS is, is the outside support. Mm -hmm. It usually depends depends on the outside support. And now that's that's really so much fading, not like uh, the, the way that we, we may want, but it's so much uh, fading because now Congress is against him, the, the European Parliament uh, just criticized him, UK they just stopped, uh, you know, yeah. the arms sales, mm. uh, and, 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 and a, lot of, a lot of parts of the world have so much a negative uh, image of MBS that he showed uh, with the Khashoggi incident. Mm. Only Trump and Jared <laughs> Kushner yeah. is still so much fighting for MBS, and I think that 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 is going to change as well. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, your your words. Very courageous, and it's very inspiring to hear about the story of your father. I guess just building on what you said, it seems like you said the whole world is against MBS and the Saudi regime. I wanted to get your uh, interpretation of the Muslim American community and their relationship to Saudi Arabia. And the Emirates, it seems like there isn't a lot of systematic uh, criticism of, of, you know, those regimes. And even like your father, for example, I don't think I've heard any message take a, a opinion or, you know, bring up the, the case of your uh, father, yeah. for example. So what's been your experience with the Muslim American community and why do you think, you know, that there's minimum criticism of, of this regime where it seems like the Muslim American community is really the uh, best position yeah. to criticize, you know, from yeah, here. Yeah, they have the space. They yeah, have with the, the freedom. Yeah, they yeah. Have, exactly. Uh, as the doctor said, they always think of the, the, like the Umrah and they go into Hajj and Umrah, right? Uh, so they, they fear that if they, I mean, they, they use the, the as I just said, like the, 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 the soft power that they have, uh, they use that uh, you know, uh, element of Hajj and Umrah is leverage over over a lot of Muslims in order not in order to 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 advance the interests of the peoples mm. of the Arab world of the Muslims or the the, the interest of the general of the general public, but but the interest of the very few on the top of the very elite who is ruling uh, the two countries. And, in, in, the, in the Gulf countries. It's very sad, uh, although like I've seen some courageous uh, people who, who spoke up like uh, Dr. Khalid Bufadal and some few others, but also we want that to grow much larger and, and wider. It is, it is, uh, uh, there is this, it, it, because it has personally bothered me enormously that Islamic organizations and Islamic centers, even those that uh, I'm in, in the back alleys and the behind the scenes, you know, they, they would, they, in, in the days when your father was free, they would always 
like, oh, you know, I, I was in Turkey and I met some men and right, all of them. Yeah. You know, they, it, it was all like name dropping and, and take pictures. pictures and, and it was, but then when he got arrested, there's this constant worry about, well, you know, if I say anything about that, then I can't go to Hajj or Umrah. And, I mean, but it, it, it's not, it's, it, it, it's like we need an, uh, a, a moral rebirth of Islam. What is the value of your Hajj and Umrah if you let a scholar yes. rot in prison and you don't say anything because you want to go to Hajj and Umrah? I mean, it, it, what is the, the meaning and the, the, the mm. meaning of Hajj of Umrah? The whole, the, the whole, the, the idea of protesting. Yeah. That's actually a really good point. Yeah. 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 I, mean, the, 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 I mean, to uh, uh, considering the stature of your father, or even the stature of someone like Karadawi, who is was completely uh, <coughs> isolated. Uh, he can't go to most countries in the world. He can't fly to the U.S. He can't go to mm. most European countries. He can't even enter most Arab countries. Yeah. And he is consistently uh, uh, demonized and 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 and, uh, and c considering uh, at least Karadawi is is in his own. But considering the stature of your father, if you compare who actually spoke the loudest on his behalf, it it really breaks my heart that I have to say it's human rights organizations, not mm. Muslims. Yeah. How, what, what, how are we going to face Allah in the final day? I mean, when, when Allah sa says, you know, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International spoke about Salman al Oda uh, uh, and his suffering, mm. while you people who do your sujood and do your psalm and do your this and do it, Compared to them, you didn't say anything. I, I really, sometimes I feel like me, was I, do I understand Islam wrong? Is, you know, is everyone right? And I'm the one who has a messed up understanding of Islam. <laughs> you know, and I, I like try to find Muslims like yourself to assure me that I understand that I didn't get it wrong, that somehow, uh, maybe, you know, I, I myself didn't. need assurance. <laughs> <laughs> You know, were, were we born in the Matrix or something? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Allah, in, uh, you know, that we, we, I think both that both of us grew up with is is is, is a law that that expects us to stand up for Abu Baruf and 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 promised us and told us that if you if you're silent about Haq, you're what you're a silent devil. Shafan Akhras. I don't know of a religion that has doctrinally a more resolute position about justice than Islam. Compared to Judaism and Christianity, and if you read theology, there's no comparison. The basis of the revelation is justice. So it, it, Our earth was built, built on, on justice. justice. Last question. Okay. Um, thank you for, for coming, Dr. Abdullah. Um, this question is directed to the both to both you and Dr. Khalid. Um, Dr. Khalid, you in your last khutbah were talking about ethics and morality being indivisible in the idea of you know, people speaking the truth and talking of justice, regardless of where the justice, the injustice may be happening. Um, this is touching, my question is touching on what can be done amongst Muslims in America particularly um, with regards to issues that we face here and then issues abroad. So like um, Sheikh uh, Salman Oud dealing with that issue. Um, looking at the youth in particular, American Muslim youth, there is more of a, 
cultural shift I think that's happening now with American youth in general, which I mean Muslim youth are a part of, this focus on social justice and activism mm. taking place across the board, so many different um, issues and uh, causes sort of uniting uh, under an umbrella. How do you think that the Muslim American youth can be inspired and driven to take on these causes that pertain to Muslims and non-Muslims. So the other issues that you know non-Muslims are facing, how we can you know forge alliances so that they stand for us and we stand for them. What what do you think are some of the ideas that can inspire such uh, movement? and hopefully create the kind of change that we're, we're looking for. And Chinyu is listening to us, that's Khutbas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's no, the no, 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 just go ahead. Well, um, it's a great question, and, and it's, uh, I, I think, uh, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was said uh, about Hilfu uh, Fulfudul, Law Kana Fil Islam, he, he, talks, he explained that because yeah, he talked about a, a, a coalition that existed during a Jahili uh, time, pre, pre Islamic pre, period. Yeah, the pre Islamic period. And during that period, there was a coalition between different tribes and different uh, parts of the, of the uh, Mecca and even Arab, uh, you know, tribes <coughs> and Arab society, uh, communities in the Arab Peninsula, and in that uh, coalition, they agreed uh, to forge uh, an alliance in order to protect everybody from uh, war, to agree to some basic uh, elements of, of having peace and uh, having, uh, you know, uh, uh, process for addressing, addressing grievances yeah. also. And how yeah, how to deal with oppression and all that. So Anibi Sallallahu said that happened before Islam uh, was born. Mm -hmm. And and if I, if that happened during uh, uh, during Islam, I will definitely attend that. Because attending that means agreeing to the basic human need for peace, for justice. And whoever, uh, you know, uh, whoever defends that is, is a person that you can agree with, is a person you can have an alliance with. So it's, it's a message that we can, as you said, forge an alliance uh, across currents and across uh, movements uh, here in the States or elsewhere in order to reach the, the common uh, interest, which is justice and, and liberty. I'll, I'll let the... the, the no, uh, he, he, he can, better, can better speak about that. No, I, I was just... No, I, just think, use the I think people get... I think you get... You know, if, if you instill in use from the very beginning that the, the, going back to the hadith that I mentioned in the khutbah that, which by the way is narrated through so many different chains of transmission that it reaches the level of tawatur, the, the being a, of, of certain authenticity that when uh, Muslims uh, they gave an oath to the Prophet ala mm -hmm. ala sabah. Uh, you know, prayer, uh, fasting, zakah, uh, hajj, uh, um, and the one right after the furud, right after the basic duties, is Nusrat al Muslim, is to always vindicate a person who suffered injustice. Now, if you, if you, re, if you're, if you basically coming to, to youth and telling them from the very beginning that 
what your religion is about is yes anchoring your soul in these practices but they must translate into a a, a, a justice project that is consistently resisting injustice and then in the same way that you find um, done in a lot of black churches or in the Southern Poverty uh, Project, for instance, uh, which immediately religious theology is translated into social projects for the manifestation of justice, for the achievement of justice. And you get young people excited about the idea how many times can, can, can you get excited about talking about prayer or, or talking about hijab or talking about uh, what are the rules of mixing between the sexes? They get bored and they, then they get bored of the entire thing. But if actually you're involving them in, in social projects and you're giving them new causes, oh, uh, you know, everyone, you know, a great scholar called Salman al Oda is in prison, and we must not quit. And be, why? Because, as a matter of principle, a scholar of Islam, uh, these are the inheritors of the Prophet himself, والسلام, and we in America, America is the leader of the free world, gives them the, the ideology. Uh, we are the representatives of liberty. And it is shameful for all of us to have is our best scholars in prison. So every time you come, we're going to do something. I think then it, it changes the attitude of these kids towards their religion. Then their religion doesn't stand for stupidity mm. and backwardness and, uh, you know, uh, intellectual lethargy. Because that's the attitude. And then when Islamophobia comes, they laugh at it. Because we, we don't have time for the stuff that Islamophobia are talking about. We're busy with actual causes. We're feeding the poor. We're helping the homeless. We're liberating political prisoners. We're, we're, then they, you get excited about Islam. But the way we're doing things, it really not just connects... <coughs> as a psychological matter, it creates associations in their, their psychology between Islam and stupidity mm. and intellectual lethargy, laziness. Mm. And worse even, those of our kids that are actually of a higher IQ, greater level of education, greater level of energy, end up leaving because they're not so attractive. And who stays, who stays active, it's usually the losers. You know, the, 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 the real losers are the ones that you see around the Islamic Center all the time and they go on. And then they come to someone like me and drive me crazy. <laughs> Which is just unfair all around. <laughs> it's just, you know, like, the, you, there has to be a break somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I remember like one scholar who, 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 uh, who works on the interpretation of uh, the ayah wa ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa on that on the coalition that you're talking about. And, uh, he said, ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al-birri before al-taqwa. Join together in achievement of, of, of <laughs> Good, goodness, goodness yeah. and the social cause yeah. and taqwa. And taqwa. And, so he said, wait. goodness between you and everybody, Muslim, non-Muslim, mm -hmm. uh, relative, non-relative, uh, 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 you know, close or far, uh, but a taqwa is between Muslims, because you have to, or, or at least those who believe in, in a taqwa, believe in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in piety. So he said, that's al-bir, al-bir ta'awanu al al-bir. We have to cooperate in achieving goodness. And goodness is, is very large and very noble, uh, you know, concept can can be justice for 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 uh, for the marginalized, uh, for the Latinos, the, the African Americans, 
uh, for those who are uh, looked at, uh, look, or looked down at, like uh, the, the, the kids, the, and then uh, can be also like a civil uh, uh, movement that uh, defends the basic rights of everybody, uh, can be uh, defending the minorities, uh, the religious minorities even. So defending the religious minorities will just reinforce your own understanding and interpretation of, of your religion itself. And they will even understand your religion by your exercise of that protection, of exercising that, that uh, you know, behavior of defending the others. Instead of just preaching uh, like uh, Islam and not thinking of what Islam means in your, in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And just building on things we've talked about here is like using the, the tools of communication and marketing and PR to take those very messages and create a Muslim identity around social justice, not around ethnicity, not yes. around, mm -hmm. you know, all the typical stuff that people say, hijab or whatever. But, you know, like what you were saying about justice is more central to our faith than any other monotheistic faith. And then giving that sense of pride to Muslim youth. It's like, yes. this is what it means to be Muslim, is that you are on the cutting edge of justice and that you are setting an example. And to be proud, you know, these traditions that show, you know, this is what we do. And that gives then, you know, that energy and pride that, you know, okay, I can, I'm Muslim because this is what Muslims stand for. And that's what's missing, I think, right now, too. too. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So. Um, in closing, can I just say something very quick that, you know, we often, I often get asked, what if the Asuli Institute had money, what would you, what the Asuli Institute do? And I'm sure, I, I, I know that, I, you know, just in case out there, <laughs> Allah wills it, and someone who has money, uh, uh, the dream, the dream is to, if, if the Asuli Institute had was properly endowed, properly supported, mm -hmm. it would come to scholars, young rising scholars like Abdullah, and offer them a postgraduate fellowship mm -hmm. because we need that thought. We need we, we need to support young scholars at risk who have no safety net. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have no safety net. It, it, you know, it's. It, I still remember when I was at that age, and you're 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 looking for it, and you say, you know, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. If, and it takes a vision, it takes a level of education, to understand the importance of providing. Postgraduate fellowships to support the research of rising gifted intellects like Abdullah's because to waste an intellect, Allah gives intellects out like Allah sends wealth to, to a nation. And a nation that wastes its intellects, an ummah that wastes its intellects will never amount to anything. And the way that intellects are wasted is that if they're not supported, if, if you have an, an, an intellect that is very rich and, and very sophisticated and very open and very willing to give, but then it finds that it has to worry about how it's going to make a living, how is it going to survive, how is it going to... It, it just put up with the normal but eventually it becomes exhausted and it withers away and that's haram so you know all those people who say well if the Sunni Institute had money what would it be, would do this is precisely what we would do we you should come before the camera no no oh, no it's okay I would just say if you can take it to the next level because it's not just a fellowship but if we you know we've talked about like creating a law school that, like I, that is so. I mean, I am. I'm it. just. I would just be happy with, you know, <laughs> just someone say, yeah, it was just a residence program, yeah. where you sponsor research, you sponsor publications, you support scholars until they find a permanent 
uh, university post, yeah. and of course, of Allah, you know, truly, just, you know, Allah just removes the shaitan from the way of Muslims, <laughs> then we would get enough of an endowment to actually start creating like a tenured positions, and it becomes a a, a, a law school or or a, a, a actual, but. I meet in my in my in my journey so many gifted young Muslim intellects, and my heart breaks as I know the struggle that is before them, and the it shouldn't be and I'll say it very bluntly it shouldn't be Christian money or Jewish money, or even you know non-Jewish non-Christian non uh, that supports them it should be Muslim money. And it support them. It should support them because they. This is a nama from Allah, a great nama. I, I mean, I have been saying this for thirty years, by the way. And and. Uh, but it exists in the Jewish tradition, like Cardoza, right? So it, they're absolutely. able to achieve that. It, Why it, are it, we it, unable to achieve it, that? It, and I, I'll tell you because I, I, when Jewish students, when they start looking for fellowships to go to graduate school, or after they finish graduate school, there are so many Jewish fellowships, not just to study in the Jewish tradition, not just in that, but even Jewish fellowships available to study Islamic studies. <laughs> Muslims, when you actually do research, you find there are only two or three, mm -hmm. and they're very oh, limited yeah, amount of money. <laughs> it, and. And then you, you compare the population of Muslims in the world to the population of Jews or... It's very sad. And, and, it, and it, 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 it really is. It, yeah. And then you, you go to rich Muslims and, and you tell them, this is our responsibility. They, they look at you and somehow, I mean, this is, I had an experience like that in Irvine, the, the, the Juan come up. <laughs> Do you know that Hassan al Banna was a British agent? I don't talk to you about supporting the young people. I don't care about Hassan al Banna and I don't care about the British agent. And I, you know, go back to the age of, go to a time, the time machine and go back to the, the time of the, the, the I don't know, it, it's insanity. It's nuts. Uh, anyway. Yeah, uh, they also like distort even the, the idea of endowment, like endowment in Islam. Yeah, it's yeah. basically mm. like supporting the knowledge, the building, like building universities, building yeah. uh, libraries throughout the Islamic world. That's what endowment in yeah. the first place is. Now endowment is just reduced to very small, mosque. like yeah, mosque, sadaqah to like very small, like one part, one part, and, and taken just, over by the state now. Yeah, and yeah. endowment. There's no private endowments anymore. They just come there's a the ministry of endowment. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, but the, previously they used to leave the endowments to operate by themselves. Yeah. Now they don't. And the, uh, the irony is in a country like Egypt, do you know till now the Christian <coughs> endowments are not controlled by the state? Really? All the Awqaf and Masihiyya, the, the state wouldn't dare come close to any of the Christian Awqaf. All the Muslim Awqaf are under the, the ministry. Mm -hmm. the, Actually, all controlled in, by in the state. Indonesia, one of the biggest. Muslim organization, which is Muhammadiyah and Hanatul Ulama. Muhammadiyah, for example, they have 100 university, 100 hospital. They basically like state within state. What make they survive is actually endowment of zakat, mm -hmm. so yeah. alcohol. Mm -hmm. And when state want to, you know, to take over, take over they reduce. Yeah. They reduce completely because say, if I take it over by state, it means I will death. So they know exactly the very basic mechanism of survival and they reject. Including Hatul Ulama, the Hatul Ulama is not that sophisticated. The, the Muhammadiyah one is so advanced in in managing the alcohol, so they can really basically have every in every village a branch of Muhammadiyah, and they build school, mm. build madrasa, and a hundred of hospital and orphanage. Basically, everything mm. based on the alcohol. Well, based on alcohol. So we should mm. all move to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, come close. You're the executive one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you everyone. I officially, we are closed. Thank you. 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 Thank you.